Good morning, Peace Church, and welcome to worship. If you're joining us on YouTube this morning, click on the link in the description below to check in. If you're joining us on Facebook, that link can be found in the comments. No matter how you're joining us, we would love to know that you've worshiped with us this morning. You will also find other helpful links such as our online giving portal and prayer request submission. If you are still able, you can continue to send in any contributions through the mail or give electronically by visiting www.peacechurch.org give. If you know of someone that doesn't have access to a computer, we encourage you to call them and worship with them over the phone. We want to make sure that everyone is still connected during this time when we are urged to stay apart. Lastly, if we can be of any assistance during this time, please don't hesitate to contact the church office. From all of us here at Peace, thank you for joining us this morning. Now let's begin worship with the singing of our opening hymn. make our beginning this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Let us now take a moment of silent reflection.
Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most gracious God, who has given your only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen.
Our gospel reading today comes to us from Matthew in chapter 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and, kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking. Jesus said to them, Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. When I was in college... I was going to Bible college, and I wanted to be a youth pastor. And the senior pastor called me into his office because he had something for me, and I was hoping it was a position as a youth pastor of the church. I was excited to walk into his office. And he proceeded to tell me and made me an offer, just not what I was looking for. His offer was that he would pay me $100 a month if I would clean the church. Now, granted, it's not as big as this church. It was a lot smaller. But uh, he offered me to go and take up the trash and vacuum and clean the restrooms. And to tell you the truth, I was disappointed. I was disappointed, but I took on the job. And, and for several months, that was my, my side job uh, from college was cleaning the church. And it was humbling, but it was necessary. It taught me a lot about appreciating, and it taught me a lot about working hard. It taught me a lot about serving. And in this passage, we have the disciples struggling with the same thing I was struggling with, was ambition. I was ambitious for a position, but I wasn't sure if I was willing to pay the price. Matthew chapter 20, we have an interesting occurrence that happened that's a little bit shocking. Two of the disciples with their mother come to Jesus and they ask. In fact, it says in the scriptures here that the mother uh, was, uh, got, got down and talked to Jesus directly. She kneeled down and asked a favor from him. She didn't come to offer him something. She came to ask him for something. And she asked that her sons, James and John, would be seated at his right and his left when he came in his kingdom. It's an interesting request because just before that, Jesus had been talking about the kingdom And he had told them that in the kingdom, things would be really different. And he had told them that they would rule with him in this new kingdom. But their intentions were ambitious. Their intentions were different. And it seemed like they weren't paying attention to what Jesus was saying. He clearly lays out when Peter proclaims him to be the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, he starts to teach him. So this was not the first time they heard him say that he was going to go to Jerusalem. He clearly says to them, takes the twelve aside, and on their way to Jerusalem, he says, we're going to go to Jerusalem, and this is what's going to happen. He's prophesying to them. Big prophecy. Not news to them. But he's clearly laying it out again, this shocking occurrence of what's, what's going to happen is that the Son of Man will be delivered, 
given up to the chief priest. They knew there was a conflict for months and even years. There was a conflict between the religious leaders and Jesus. And they're always at odds. And Jesus kept on speaking and preaching with authority. And he would heal the sick. And he would cast out demons. And he, he would have the crowds coming after him. And then he would be challenged by the religious leaders. So there was this constant challenging back and forth. And Jesus would challenge them. They would challenge him. They would ask of what authority he had to teach these things and to heal on the Sabbath and, and to not have his disciples wash their hands correctly. Who was he? And he kept on speaking to them in parables. And they were angry and they were threatened. And they were concerned about their power because the crowds grew bigger and bigger. And in fact, there were some who believed that Jesus was a prophet, and even some believed that he was the Messiah. For sure, the disciples believed that. So Jesus here speaks to them that finally it was going to come to a head. They were going to go to Jerusalem. They were going to confront the religious leaders, and Jesus would be handed over to them. They would hand them over to the Gentiles, in other words, to the Romans. And what that meant to the disciples was that there's no getting out of this. What that meant was imprisonment or death. Jesus says it clearly. It's not imprisonment. It's death. The Romans would torture him and then crucify him. And then he would be raised to life. It was a somber moment. This was a very serious thing that Jesus is speaking to them about. But they could not reconcile how he speaks of this coming government that he was going to establish in Israel. And this other horrible occurrence of his death, of his torture, of being given over to his enemies for them to do what they want and to finally kill him. They did not understand how they were reconciled both, but Jesus told them, I would be raised to life. And so, though they heard it, they really didn't get it. Because in this somber moment, as they're walking to Jerusalem, as they're shocked about the news that it's going to happen now. Now I'm, we're going to go to Jerusalem, and these things are going to occur, these horrible things. It's when James and John bring their mother to Jesus. And like any mom, she wants good things for her kids. She doesn't want the death. She doesn't want them to suffer with Jesus. The only part they heard is the good stuff, right? They heard the kingdom is coming and he will rule and they will rule with him. So mom comes along and the Reason is for her ambition. She wants good things for her kids. It's an amazing moment. It's amazing because Jesus had just talked about suffering and passion. And she oddly requests that they would have position. That they would have status. That they would have power. And part of me doesn't blame the, her because that's what I really hope for my kids, that they would have good things, that they would have success, and that they have, would have position and responsibility to do good things. It is possible that their mother of James and John was Salome, who was the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And it's possible that they were all related. Maybe that's why she thought she could come to Jesus because that's my nephew. I'm asking my nephew for a favor. And so she approached them with her sons, James and John, who Jesus called the sons of thunder because they were both aggressive, because they were both powerful and ambitious. We don't know if the mother initiated the discussion with her sons or the sons initiated and said, hey, mom, would you talk to Jesus for us? 
Would, would you get us there? Because there were discussions earlier about who would be more in charge in the disciples. And Jesus had already told them about little children, and it's the least of these that he cared about. But as Jesus was sharing with them about this big conflict about to come and to start, they press forward with this discussion. Hey, before you go, before we get there, before the conflict, before all that, can we sit at your right and your left? Can my son sit with you, Jesus? Now, if you read the scriptures, you understand that James and John were just not two disciples. They were the closest disciples. It was Peter, the first, and then there was James and John. And those three were with Jesus in certain places, privately with him. They were the closest. And Mary knew that, and Salome knew that, the whole family knew that that not only Jesus was the Messiah and he was bringing in thousands of people, but James and John were right there, very close to Jesus. So for them, it seemed natural to ask, can we sit next to you? See, they were both ignorant and very naive of what they were really, really asking for and the reality of the moment. This was not a moment of power grabbing, there was a, this was a moment of compassion, of Jesus speaking of the suffering he's about to have, and they're only thinking about themselves. That's what happens with ambition. We get too focused on power. We don't want to focus on the suffering. It's like my son at the beginning of last summer when I said, hey, we can mow some lawns and make some money. What do you think? He goes, Yeah. I, and I said, we can share in the, the profits. And he goes, says, yeah, that was exciting. And then we went out to mow the first lawn, and he wasn't as excited. We mowed the second lawn, and he wasn't that excited after that. And by the end of the summer, he didn't want to mow lawns anymore. Or it's like my daughter who wants to be part of the National Honor Society, and she's smart enough to make it at school, but she did not want to do the homework and the work. She made it, but it cost her a lot more than she thought. Success has a price. Power has a price. And the truth is, is that James and John didn't really understand what they were asking for. Mom did not know what she was asking for. Mom didn't want her sons to be persecuted. She didn't want her sons to be killed and to die and to be tortured. So she did not realize what she was asking, and neither did the disciples. They respond with, yes, we can. Because are you willing to drink of this cup? Are you willing to experience what I'm going to experience? And they're like, yes, yes. They didn't know their future. But Jesus did, and he says to them this prophecy, yes, you will, for sure. You will drink this cup. You will go through what I went through, or will go through. But those seeds of seating at the right and the left are not for me to give. That's up to the Father. So they got the opposite of what they were asking, in a sense, because they were told that they would suffer, but they are not assured of the right seat and the left seat. They don't have any advantages. And they thought they might because they're somewhat related, because they're always with Jesus, because mom asked, maybe. No, there is no advantage. Because of the family, because of the history. James after the resurrection, ended up becoming the pastor of Jerusalem, of the church in Jerusalem. And so he had a very strong, prominent position with the church. So he did end up with power and prominence, but he was also captured and tortured. 
James was the first disciple to be martyred. He was beheaded. So did he get what he wanted? He wanted more power? He wanted more prop providence? Yes, he did. And Paul, therefore, warns us to be careful with selfish ambition. Tradition tells us that John the Apostle, he was arrested and he was thrown in prison. And then he was thrown into a burning pot of oil in the Colosseum. Tradition says that he wasn't harmed by that. And they had to take him out. And because of that, many, if not most, of the people in this Colosseum came to Christ. And then John, therefore, was banished. Since they could not kill him, he was banished to the island of Patmos to live alone. And he could never leave there for the rest of his life. It is there that John wrote the book of Revelation and probably including 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. So did they get a prominent seat? Maybe not what they were looking for, but they ended up serving Christ for the rest of their life and suffered greatly. You see, it's not odd that our ambition sometimes blinds us, that our ambition keeps us from having good judgment. That's what happened to their mom and happened to them. People are willing to do all kinds of things to get ahead, to get more power, to get more control, to get more money. And that's why Paul says in Philippians to watch out for that selfish ambition because selfish ambition divides us from people. Selfish ambition gets in the way of relationship. And Paul says in Philippians 2, do the opposite. Jesus came and instead of having selfish ambition with the power he was given, not only is he the Son of God and Son of Man, but the devil himself tempted him and said, if you will bow down and worship me, I will give you everything. Everything is yours if you would just bow down to me. That was Satan's temptation to Jesus. And it was a real temptation. And Jesus said, no. Get away from me, Satan. Selfish ambition is not just against God's goals, but it really causes problems with other people around us. Relational re Oneness is broken by selfish ambition. Look at your life. Look at your work. Look at your family. And everywhere we see conflict, we see hints of selfish ambition. It's true in my family. It's true in my past relationships. It's true in everywhere I've been, whether in church or nonprofits or now in business. I see it everywhere that it causes problems. When one employee wants a position and they take every advantage to get it, but sometimes they give up on relationship. I look at my own life and the people that I have had conflict with over and over again. Most of the time, it's selfish ambition. Most of the time, it's that I put myself over someone else. It's that I value position higher than I value somebody else. It's that I see myself as better than them or that I see them as less them than myself or see them as an object. When I see other people as objects to use, to step over, to get to a place or to set aside it causes conflict. You see, the disciples at that time were not willing to suffer yet. It was until after the resurrection, it was until after the Holy Spirit came upon them and they were empowered that they were able and willing to give up their life for Christ, but not at this point. In fact, when Jesus was arrested, they fled. They weren't there 
ready to stand up for Jesus. They fled in fear, and they were hiding. The guys who said they were willing to take of that cup were nowhere to be found when Jesus was being flogged and crucified. Finally, at the cross, when Jesus is there, John comes. But we have no proof that James was even there. You see, many people are willing to gain position, but not willing to suffer. D.L. Moody said, There are many of us that are willing to do great things for the Lord, but few of us are willing to do little things. And sometimes it means just picking up. Sometimes it means service, serving others. And that's what Jesus wants his disciples to understand. You see, the other disciples at this time were indignant. Matthew says they were angry at John and James for using their mother to get to Jesus, for being selfish and wanting a position for using their family's connections to get ahead. Or maybe they were angry that they weren't there first. That they weren't cunning enough to try to get that selfish position. And it caused division within the disciples. In the moment where Jesus is talking about suffering and passion and giving of his life, he could have taken a great position of authority, but instead he became a servant. Philippians tells us in chapter 2, he emptied himself of that power so that he could serve and be a servant and minister to us. And that's why we see in Scripture that God doesn't work the way you and I work. It's not by getting more education. It's not by getting more power. It's not by getting more money. It's not by getting more control. It's not by getting more status or getting more stuff. That's not what impresses God. What impresses God is humility and service. And for some of us, we need to divest of our things that we have and responsibilities that we take on so that we can serve God more. We are so busy getting more that we can't give much to God. So this passage here, Jesus tells us that in the midst of the shocking moment of his death and burial and resurrection, he explains to them the difference between the kingdom and the world. In the world, it's, he uses this, he says, the authorities, they lord their power over you and others. The high officials exercise authority over them, and they know this is true. They've seen it. They saw the Roman soldiers, and they saw the tax collectors like Matthew, and, and then they saw the religious leaders who would take on more for themselves and use their position and their power for their own glory, for their own status, and for their own money. And he said, that's the way the world works, but not so with you. In verse 26, he says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be the servant. And again, this is another part of Jesus' shocking teaching that this is the way kingdom works, opposite of the world, opposite of the, how you think. It's, op it's so counterintuitive to the way you and I work. Because the way you and I work is if you want something, you go and grab it before anybody else does. That's what we're told. That's what we're taught. That's how we feel inside because that comes from selfish thinking, a mindset that believes that in order for me to get, I have to go and grab it. Jesus said, the mindset's wrong. That's not how my people, my followers, my kingdom works. And his kingdom, his, the mindset of a believer is, in order for me to get, I have to give. 
in order for me to be first, I have to be last. In fact, he says it this way, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is telling James and John and the rest of the disciples who all are ambitious. They all want position. They follow Jesus for three years, and they're still thinking about their own gain. This is insidious to who we are. It's part of our sin that we constantly are struggling and fighting against this bent inside of us to think about us first. And Jesus gives the example for, you know, if, if you want to be first, if you want to be ambitious, if you want to have position in the kingdom of God, you must give, you must serve, and you must be last. That's the economy of God that's the government of God being established right here, right now, in your life, in my life. If, that, if we want to be first before God, then we must be last. And we, we must be willing to serve anybody. I see it here at the church. On Sunday morning, I see people volunteering to do things, to clean up after the service, and to, do, and to work out and open doors as ushers and to do many things. But this should be real, not just here. It should be real everywhere you go in your whole life. For Jesus himself did not come to be served, though he deserved it. Though he had the position as the Son of God, as the deity, the Messiah, the King. The King himself made himself a servant, not counting equality with God to be something to be grasped after, and went to the cross and gave himself for you and I so that you and I could receive the blessing of that service and be reconciled to God and then be reconciled to each other. Selfish ambition not only hurts our relationship with God, it hurts our relationship with our brothers and sisters and those around us. Instead, what heals those relationships, what heals those things is service. Serving them, serving those around you, your neighbors, your co-workers, your fellow students. And that is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. May the God of heaven who gave up his son for you, inspire you and move you through his Holy Spirit to serve others as you serve him. Amen. We confess our faith now together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Join me this morning as we pray for the church and for the whole people of God everywhere. Most gracious and everlasting Father, Alpha and Omega, the one who was and who is and who is to come, the God who neither sleeps nor slumber, have mercy upon us, O God, 
and blot out our transgressions. According to your steadfast love, wash us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. When our heart is overwhelmed, lead us to the rock that is higher than us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With contrite hearts and broken spirits, we come to you this morning, O oh God, pleading for peace, comfort, and healing for all who are sick and afflicted in our midst. Even as your word declares that healing is the children's bread, we say this day, give us our daily bread and remember us in our season of affliction. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As it is no secret that as a nation, as a people, as a church, and as a family, we are faced with some of the most trying and uncertain times our world has ever seen. We pray for wisdom, for understanding, for tolerance, and for reconciliation in this hour, Lord. Even as we are concerned about safety and order and peaceful coexistence, I pray that you cause us, the church, the ambassadors of Christ in the earth, to be equally as concerned about justice, about equality, and about righteousness. Break our hearts for the things that break your hearts. Break our hearts for the things that break yours. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Once again, we present our families to you, Lord Jesus. Keep them, protect them, and deliver them from all evil, seen and unseen. We cancel every evil assignment and uproot every demonic entrapment the enemy has designed for our children and our loved ones. We lift up our country, our leaders, our military and police, our first responders, and all those on the front lines of protecting and securing our well-being. Remember them, O oh God, and let there be a prodigious outpouring of your grace, mercy, peace, love, and protection upon them all. May they feel you nearer to them every hour of every day in every way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In closing, Lord, we lift up Peace Church, your people, your congregation, as well as the, as the church universal. May we be known for our love for God and our neighbor. May we embrace your call for our lives and learn to walk upright before you, showing mercy, loving justice, reflecting your great love, and spreading the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray when we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now hear these words from Jude. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.